Good evening, everybody. I'm Adrian Basara, the chairman of the Walpole International Affairs Discussion Group. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Ambassador Stapleton Roy. Ambassador Roy's relationship to China goes back for more than 70 years when he witnessed the Chinese Civil War from the rooftop of the American school in Shanghai. And it was also in China that he met Mary McMahon, the beginning of a friendship that has lasted, lasted more than 70 years, so, uh, more than seven decades. As you know, Mary is one of the founding members of the Walpole International Affairs Discussion Group. Uh, during Stapleton Roy's exceptional 45 year foreign service career, he served as ambassador to Singapore, Indonesia and China. And very importantly, in the late 1970s, he participated in the secret negotiations that led to the establishment of American and US relations, diplomatic official diplomatic relations with the Communist People's Republic of China, which included an understanding regarding Taiwan that has lasted for nearly 50 years. In the course of Stapleton Roy's career, he, learned, he also learned Russian and served in Moscow, which gives him a unique perspective on the China-Russia relationship. And his service as Assistant Secretary of State for Intelligence and Research was a further opportunity to see the world from an extraordinarily extraordinary strategic vantage point. And early in my career, I had a, an opportunity to work in, in the Bureau of Intelligence and Research. And I can tell you that it's an extraordinary uh, challenge and that uh, Stapleton Roy ran it very well indeed. Ambassador Roy's presentation will be on China and Taiwan tonight. But in the question and answer period, it's also agreed to tackle your questions, our questions on how China relates to the Ukraine crisis. So now let me turn it over to you, uh, State. Adrian, thank you for that introduction and good evening to all of you. Last month was the 50th anniversary of President Nixon's visit to China in February, 1972. That event was a master stroke of diplomacy. It stunned the world and altered the course of the Cold War in a manner highly favorable to US interests. Above all, it illustrated the vital importance for diplomacy of leaders who can rise above conventional thinking, spot opportunities, and act decisively in pursuit of a strategic objective, qualities all too rare in world history. The gulf between China and the United States in the early 1970s was far greater than it is now. China was in the midst of the turmoil of the Great Cultural Revolution, where gangs of teenage Red Guards were running amok throughout the country. The United States was bogged down in the Vietnam War on China's southern border, where Beijing was funneling supplies to Hanoi in its battle against the so-called American imperialists and shooting down U.S. aircraft that strayed into the Chinese airspace. American prisoners from the Korean War were languishing in Chinese jails. President Nixon's decision to risk his personal prestige and possibly his presidency on a trip to China was not based on secret information. He made his decisions based on international developments that were public knowledge. American intelligence analysts had detected cracks in the Sino-Soviet alliance as early as 1958. Moreover, beginning with the Kennedy administration, American leaders had understood the significance of these developments and felt growing frustration that the hostile relationship between Washington and Beijing limited the ability of the United States to take full advantage of the worsening relations between Beijing and Moscow. However, they lacked the vision and courage to devise a strategy to take advantage of these events. This is where the leadership of President Nixon made itself felt. While others rolled their eyes in amazement at the intensifying hostility between Moscow and Beijing, President Nixon saw an opportunity for a breakthrough with China that more conventional thinkers failed to see. President Nixon's visit to China was an unmistakable first step toward recognizing the PRC as the real government of China. 
However, to complete the process, it was necessary for Washington to deal with the legacy of its post-Korean War security relationships with Taiwan. Equally important, it had to establish a framework for managing trade and cultural relations with Taiwan in the absence of diplomatic relations. No other country faced a comparable problem. President Nixon laid the groundwork for addressing this task through the Shanghai Communique, a joint statement in which Washington and Beijing each set out their respective positions on Taiwan and on a variety of international issues. Is Completing the process of normalization, however, proved to be so difficult that it took over six more years and two more U.S. presidential administrations to accomplish. In the meantime, the United States was in a precarious position. The president's visit to China had opened the floodgates for other countries to switch diplomatic recognitions from Taipei to Beijing. The United States was in danger of becoming isolated as one of the last major powers to establish diplomatic relations with Beijing. Washington could not afford to sit on its hands. The stumbling block was that the United States had to address the three conditions that Beijing had set for establishing diplomatic relations, which entailed breaking diplomatic relations with a friendly government, the Republic of China in Taipei, ending the Sino-US Mutual Defense Treaty with the Republic of China, and withdrawing US military forces from Taiwan. Because of the magnitude of these steps, which were certain to be controversial in the United States, Three consecutive U.S. administrations made a concerted effort to secure better terms for establishing ambassadorial level diplomatic relations with Beijing that would permit the United States to retain a reduced level of official or quasi-official relations with Taiwan. With this goal in mind, President Ford's Secretary of State Henry Kissinger visited Beijing in October 1975 where he explored with Deng Xiaoping the possibility of retaining some form of a reduced official relationship with Taipei. Deng was adamantly opposed. Two months later, President Ford visited Beijing and informed Deng that he, had, he needed to postpone normalization until after his hoped for victory in the November 1976 presidential election. Deng was visibly upset at the delay and terminated the meeting early. Following Jimmy Carter's election in November 76, Secretary of State Cyrus Vance visited Beijing in the summer of 1977 to explore once again the possibility of retaining some form of official, official relationship with Taipei following normalization with Beijing. Deng Xiaoping once again was unyielding. Based on this record, President Carter concluded that he would have to meet the three Chinese conditions. He was adamant, however, that the United States must retain the right to continue arms sales to Taiwan after we broke diplomatic relations with Taipei. On a visit to Beijing in May 1978, President Carter's National Security Advisor Brzezinski reached agreement with the Chinese to begin secret normalization negotiations in Beijing in July 1978. Before beginning the negotiations, Administration officials briefed the top leaders in both houses of Congress on a highly confidential basis regarding the president's willingness to meet the three Chinese conditions while continuing arms sales to Taiwan. The response was that the administration was doing the right thing, but that President Carter should expect congressional criticism when he did it. The negotiations with Beijing concluded successfully in mid-December 1978, when the two sides issued a second joint communique announcing their intention to establish diplomatic relations on January 1, 1979. It's worth noting that the shock to the international community of the announcement that the United States and the People's Republic of China had successfully concluded their negotiations over establishing diplomatic relations was almost as great as the revelation seven years earlier that President Nixon would be visiting Beijing in 1972. Twice in a decade, the United States have been able to engineer major changes in its relationship with China in total secrecy. 
The impact on the Soviet Union of President Nixon's opening to China was the opposite of what many expected. Rather than worsening U.S. relations with Moscow, it produced an immediate improvement. Soon after his trip to China in 1972, President Nixon became the first American president to visit Moscow, where he signed a strategic arms limitation treaty and an anti-ballistic missile treaty, the first two major steps toward limiting the growth of nuclear arms. The prestige of American diplomacy was never higher. The lessons from the Nixon breakthrough with China are still relevant today. At the moment, conventional thinking is driving Washington and Beijing towards strategic rivalry and potential conflict. For some time, our policy toward China has been heavily influenced by domestic considerations that both influence and limit our options. From a foreign policy standpoint, it's always a danger signal when domestic attitudes have too large an influence in formulating foreign policy, which should be shaped primarily by an objective understanding of external conditions that will determine the success or failure of alternative approaches. Such conditions are frequently ignored or grossly distorted in domestic debate. Foreign policies, of course, cannot be effectively implemented if they lack domestic support. Therefore, policymakers need to take domestic attitudes into account. Indeed, they have the responsibility to cultivate domestic attitudes that will support foreign policy initiatives. Even broad domestic support, however, cannot guarantee success for a misguided foreign policy approach that ignores the realities of the world outside our borders. The virtual summit last year between President Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping was a step in the right direction in addressing the sharp decline in Sino-U.S. relations in recent years. It temporarily improved the tone of our official interactions with China, which had deteriorated to a shocking degree. There were some positive accomplishments. The two presidents agreed to meet regularly to guide the relationship. President Biden reaffirmed our One China policy, asserted we were not supporting independence for Taiwan, and declared we were not seeking regime change in China. The two leaders agreed to have conversations on strategic matters. Limited cooperation on climate change matters appears possible in the wake of their discussions. This is better than nothing, but the big issues that affect the business climate between the two countries have not yet been addressed. The summit was unproductive on economic issues. It revealed a significant difference in goals for the relationship. The Biden administration has defined three components of the relationship, competition, cooperation, and confrontation. Its preference seems to be for steady state competition as the goal. In other words, to stabilize competition as the main characteristic. President Xi Jinping was insistent in his discussion with President Biden that the goal should be peaceful coexistence. That's an important difference. The Chinese are emphasizing cooperation as the key component, and we're emphasizing competition as the key component. This cloudy outlook will be significantly influenced by three factors. The first is the degree of hostility of domestic attitudes in the United States toward globalization without any understanding of the limited degree of responsibility globalization has for job loss or of the anti inflationary benefits in terms of lower prices. This is limiting the administration's willingness to consider trade agreements. The second is the absence of an administration economic strategy for the Indo Pacific. This is a glaring admission, omission. Nearly a year into the Biden administration, the trade war tariffs remain in place. The administration shows no inclination to join the successor to the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which we had launched ourselves and then withdrew from, or the Regional Cooperative Economic Partnership, Comprehensive Economic Partnership, of which all of the Asian countries are members and the United States is conspicuously not a member. Pressure is mounting on the White House to formulate an economic strategy. 
and there are a few hints that something may be forthcoming, but there's nothing yet that would provide a basis for business decisions. The third is the Taiwan issue, which is an albatross around the neck of the administration. The administration's one China policy is sloppy at best. Senior officials from the president on down have not mastered the terminology that's essential in implementing a one China policy. It's very much in the United States interest to find a way to stabilize the cross-strait relationship between Taiwan and the China mainland. Beijing's goal is unification, but it recognizes that the Taiwan issue is a legacy problem left over from the Chinese Civil War and the Korean War, and that it will take time to find a resolution. At the same time, China has made it crystal clear that it will use military force to prevent Taiwan's formal separation from China. The one China framework agreed on when Washington and Beijing established diplomatic relations has stood the test of time. Within it, Taiwan has prospered as never before, achieving a per capita income equivalent to that of Canada. 10 years ago, cross-strait relations were thriving and tensions were low. This is no longer the case. President Xi Jinping has referred to Taiwan as a ticking time bomb. It's instructive to look at the last 40 years of cross-strait relations. In 1992, the cross-strait relationship was just getting off the ground. Taiwan products were becoming more available on the mainland, and the number of Taiwan visitors was rising rapidly. In 2002, 10 years later, Beijing was adjusting to the election of the first Democratic Progressive Party president in Taiwan. That's a party that openly espouses independence for Taiwan, although it was not part of the program of the president elected from that party. The DPP, the Democratic Progressive Party, was skeptical about the desirability of a rapid expansion of economic trade and investment ties with the mainland. But the pressures in Taiwan for expansion were too great to hold back. The United States was diligent in keeping Taiwan within a one China framework, which helped contain Beijing's discomfort. So we had a situation where the economic relationship across the strait was rapidly developing, even though a key party in Taiwan was reluctant to see it expand further, but the economic incentives were too strong. In 2012, 12 years later, cross-strait economic relations were booming and cross-strait tensions were low. There was an explosion of direct air links between Taiwan and mainland cities. On a visit to Xiamen, the city directly across the strait from Taiwan, Local residents recounted to me the difficulty they had in getting used to seeing planes heading directly across the strait toward Taiwan. In the past, these would have been war planes instead of commercial airliners. In 2022, 10 years later, everything has changed for the worse. Beijing has suspended cross-strait liaison channels. Tensions are rising. In the United States, there's increasing talk of potential war with China over Taiwan, and domestic attitudes in both countries have shifted in the direction of mutual hostility. The principal contributing factor is the refusal of the current Taiwan government to acknowledge a one China framework in any form. All the previous Taiwan governments attached importance to the one China principle. This government is refusing to do so. The U.S. government chose not to confront Taiwan over this issue in 2016, when the current president was elected to her first term, hoping that maintaining a status quo based on earlier affirmations of the 92 consensus between Taiwan and the mainland on one China. Washington hoped that would be sufficient, but it was a misreading of the importance of the one China principle to Beijing, and it would not accept a failure to mention one China as part of the program of the existing government. Just as the failure of NATO countries to confront Moscow in 2014 over its decision to sever Crimea from Ukraine 
and incorporated it into Russia is an important factor contributing to the current Russian aggression against Ukraine. The failure of the United States to confront Taiwan in 2016 over its departure from a one China framework is an important factor increasing the likelihood of a future conflict between Beijing and Washington over Taiwan. In essence, we have been sucked into a vicious cycle in which Beijing increases military pressure on Taiwan to deter moves toward independence, and the United States responds by strengthening military ties to Taiwan, which in the eyes of Beijing is a violation of the normalization arrangements. Breaking out of this vicious cycle should be a major policy goal for both Washington and Beijing. Failure to do so will make it difficult to avoid a further downward spiral in the U.S.-China relationship. A stable and sustainable status quo can only be established on the basis of a one-China position, under which the United States can only have unofficial relations with Taiwan. Aside from the issue of Taiwan, China has contributed its own share of problems and sour attitudes in the United States toward Beijing. Its domestic repression is reducing the value of bilateral consultations. Its handling of Hong Kong and Xinjiang is a staple of negative media coverage of China. And there are question marks about where it is heading, where China is heading, both economically and politically. China faces the massive task of escaping from the middle income trap. Nearly 90% of countries that reach middle income levels fail to reach high income levels. To escape from this trap, China will have to rely on increasing productivity and innovation. China is focused on meeting this challenge and is giving major attention to new technologies such as artificial intelligence, robotics, and quantum computing. If the United States wants to hold on to its lead in these areas, it must outcompete China on innovation and productivity. The United States will fall behind if it walls itself off from the global economy and uses tariffs to protect U.S. jobs. As we saw in earlier decades, if U.S. companies do not maintain an edge in global competition, they will be hard put to retain domestic market share without protective barriers that will lead to U.S. workers producing inferior but more costly products. A key element in our competition with China is ensuring that we retain the edge in terms of the productivity of our economy. Under Deng Xiaoping's reform and openness policies, continued under Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao, China did achieve remarkable rates of growth for a sustained period of time. However, Xi Jinping has introduced significant changes to this model. Instead of promoting further market reforms and making loans more readily available to China's private enterprises, he is placing greater reliance on China's state-owned sector, whose productivity is one-third the productivity of China's private sector. Under Xi Jinping, China has become less receptive to direct foreign investment. China's domestic system has become more repressive, clamping down on a broad range of people who express views implicitly critical of the government, ranging from doctors to human rights lawyers to top business magnates such as Jack Ma. Xi Jinping is now seeking to limit the influence of some of China's most successful technology companies, who in his view have become too big for their britches. At the moment, it's too early to tell what the impact of these measures will be on China's economic development. What we do know is that Xi's economic growth model has departed in significant ways from the successful Dungist model, largely responsible for China's extraordinary economic growth. The growing domestic repression is indicative of underlying resistance to Xi Jinping's style of rule. Chinese policy experts have become less willing to provide frank advice to top leaders. These are Chinese experts on foreign policy. They have complained that they no longer dare to provide frank advice to the top leaders. 
This is not likely to lead to regime collapse or domestic instability, since available evidence suggests that Xi Jinping still exercises tight control over China's security organizations. However, it does suggest that beneath the surface, China is not as stable as the authorities would have us believe. The other side of the coin is that China has substantial numbers of young, ambitious entrepreneurs who are champing at the bit to demonstrate their prowess at launching successful companies. Chinese leaders are developing concepts such as dual circulation to tap into China's vast pool of savings to make domestic consumption a more important driver of China's economic growth rate without sacrificing its position in the global marketplace. Leaders are conscious of the explosive potential of the overconcentration of wealth at the top and are promulgating concepts such as common prosperity to signal that they are addressing the problem. In the meantime, in preparation for the 20th Party Congress next this year, Xi Jinping is positioning himself as one of the two great leaders of China during the first hundred years of the Chinese Communist Party. Mao is the great revolutionary who overcame enormous odds to make the Chinese Communist Party the ruling party in China. Xi Jinping is the great rejuvenator who will lead a more powerful and prosperous China during the final stages of the long march to realization of the Chinese dream of wealth and power. Deng Xiaoping, who actually launched China on the fast path to great power status, is not ignored, but he is only granted a secondary role, as are other Chinese Communist Party leaders. The resolution on party history adopted last year characterized the introduction of the reform and openness policies to the party and not to Deng Xiaoping personally. To clear the way for him to continue as China's top leader, Xi Jinping pushed through the removal of the two-term limit in the national constitution for presidents. While the party has enforced two-term limits for party general secretaries for two decades, this is a tradition rather than a constitutional requirement for the party leader. So Xi has positioned himself to violate the two-term limits at the 20th Party Congress this fall. If all goes well from Xi Jinping's standpoint, we can anticipate that in Xi Jinping, we will be dealing with a strong leader with a clear sense of the ambitious goals that he wants China to achieve by 2035 and by mid-century. He intends to demonstrate that China has the will, the resources, the leadership, and the timetable for playing a much more significant role on the world stage. Xi Jinping's self-confidence was displayed at the virtual summit with President Biden late last year and could spell trouble for the United States. If he is successful in his efforts to revitalize the party and turn it into a more effective tool for addressing China's many domestic problems, we should not underestimate his capabilities and his determination to protect and enhance China's national interests. At a time when democracy in the United States is facing its most severe challenge since the Civil War, a century and a half ago, there are compelling reasons for not defining our competition with China in terms of a civilizational conflict between democracy and authoritarianism, as we are now doing. For one thing, in our competition with China, we need to work with countries such as Vietnam, whose political system is far from democratic. We would be better served by reflecting on some of the deficiencies of democracy along with its successes. Properly functioning democracy is the only truly modern form of governance. The just powers of governance, in other words, the legitimacy of democratic systems, rests on elections that reflect the will of the people. Such systems also rely on checks and balances to prevent the concentration of power that leads to tyranny. These core features permit enormous diversity in particular forms of good democracy with each form taking on national characteristics. Every modern 
form of governance around the world has those characteristics. The form of governance in China is a pre-modern form of governance in which there are no checks and balances on the power held by the top leaders. So in China's modernization process, the contradiction between having a modernized economy and a modernized society and a pre-modern political system is going to become worse and worse. And this is one of China's big challenges. However, democracies contain the seeds of their own destruction. They are dependent on middle classes for their vitality. They cannot function without compromise. They are vulnerable to popular passions and demagogues, and they are capable of precipitating wars. Democracies cannot function in polarized societies. We have experienced this once before, and the result was a bloody civil war. Because of these deficiencies, democracies have a significant mortality rate. The democracies that emerged in Europe after the First World War could not manage the contradictions between nationalism and self-determination created by the checkerboard distribution of minority ethnic groups in Central Europe. They were replaced by authoritarian alternatives. The weaknesses of European democracies in addressing the rising threat of conflict permitted Hitler to run roughshod over the continent. The United States, equally unprepared, was only saved by its ocean moats. These were insufficient to prevent the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. The utility of moats has been vitiated by the development of intercontinental missiles with nuclear warheads. The point I'm making is democracies do not have a stellar record of actually addressing security problems as they emerge. The United States, which used to be seen by many as the shining city on the hill, now has a dysfunctional Congress riddled with members who put party interests ahead of national interests, refer, refer to their opponents as the enemy, and promulgate the goal of disrupting the ruling party's ability to address national and global problems. The vibrant democracy on Taiwan is a global success story, but it is emulating the demonstrators in Hong Kong by thumbing its nose at Beijing and hoping the United States will deal with the potential consequences. Its geographic proximity to the China mainland makes this a risky proposition. No matter how the United States responds in a conflict scenario, it cannot protect Taiwan from the destructive potential of conventional missiles. As is in the case of Hong Kong demonstrators, Congress is falling over itself to show support for Taiwan's defiance of the mainland often in ways that make conflict more likely or even inevitable. The issue is not whether democracy in Taiwan is admirable, it is. What is not admirable is to encourage a democracy to court its own destruction or for a self-governing island. That's the key aspect of Taiwan. It is self-governing. This is not an island trying to escape from a domineering repressive Government. This is not a Xinjiang. It's not a Kashmir. It's not admirable for a self-governing island to precipitate a conflict between China and the United States over its status in the world. Public sentiment on Taiwan overwhelmingly supports a status quo that avoids conflict and permits productive cross-strait relations. That status quo used to exist. It does no longer. Both Congress and the Biden administration need to work together with Taiwan to restore such a status quo. Beijing needs to respond by stopping military pressure on Taiwan. It would be tragic if a democratic Taiwan precipitates a self-destructive conflict and fails its most important test. In concluding, I need to point out the obvious, which is that Russia's naked aggression against Ukraine has fundamentally altered the international situation. The timing could not have been worse from the standpoint of both the United States and China. Once again, just as the United States was planning to give priority attention to the Indo-Pacific region, we now have the worst crisis in Europe since World War II. 
In China's case, just weeks after Xi Jinping and Putin issued a joint statement celebrating their close strategic partnership, Putin has violated the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine. These principles, respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity, are the principles that Beijing ranks highest among the important principles of the international system. The war in Ukraine has given rise to extensive speculation as to whether Putin's bold action to recover what he claims to be a former Russian territory in Ukraine will inspire Xi Jinping to advance his own timetable for recovery of Taiwan. It is premature to draw any firm conclusions on such questions at the moment, since it is still far from clear what the outcome in Ukraine will be. Nevertheless, it is safe to say that the crisis in Europe will have an impact on US-China relations, whose nature will depend to a significant degree on the quality of US diplomacy. We are indeed living in troubled times and the burdens of making the right decisions is greater than ever. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Stapleton Roy. That was eye-opening and disturbing and unnerving, but um, fascinating. Thank you very much. We're going to begin our question and answer period now. Um, and to lead off, I'm going to invite Mary McMahon, a friend of yours, to ask the first question. Uh, thank you for that very comprehensive, historical, geographical, contextual, cultural summary of where we've come. And of course, you answered all my questions. <laughs> <laughs> that was probably inevitable. But I want to ask you something that is a little off the track. And maybe this is not something you are privy to. But there's a lot of theory about the fact that Putin only listens to his sycophants and that they tell him whatever they think will make him feel better. And I know that was true with Mao Zedong also. Do you think that's possible with Xi Jinping and especially these people who are clamoring for his special attention? Yes. It's a problem of all... Uh, uh, um, authoritarian systems. When I lived in the Soviet Union, the Soviet leaders had no idea how strong the dissatisfaction was among the Soviet, the, the, the Russian people, uh, because they couldn't express their views openly. So when they wanted to raise the price of bread by a few kopecks, they debated for years because they were afraid that maybe raising the price of bread to COPEX would create a reaction that would destabilize the system. When they wanted to raise the price of vodka, they withdrew the entire vodka brand and reissued it in new bottles and new labels, same vodka, and raised the price of that. So they had to go through that type of contortion because they no longer could read accurately the attitudes of the Russian people. That problem is emerging in China. If you express any dissatisfaction toward the government, you are immediately suppressed. Uh, for a while, the internet in China had post-censorship. So you could get a sense of the expressions of dissatisfaction before it was suppressed. But now they're tightening up on that. And as I mentioned earlier, what we are told by leading China international relations specialists is they no longer can discuss issues freely with their colleagues because the colleagues will speak from a script. When a leading professor at a Chinese university visits for example, a factory to give a talk about um, foreign policy, there will be a list on the podium of the do's and don'ts that he has to respect in giving his remarks. Under that type of a situation, the leader becomes increasingly remote 
from actual attitudes in the country. And the result is they have to keep tightening repression because they don't know how strong the pressure is and therefore they have to go the extra mile to make sure that no one can express dissent. So it's a dangerous situation. So I just want to add then, do you imagine that these people who are close to Xi Jinping and telling him what it is, so on, do you think they have an agenda to follow Putin's example and invade Taiwan? China has the goal of reuniting Taiwan with the mainland. But they've had that for a long time now. He's had, the, it's the product of the Civil War. When I served in Taiwan in the 1960s, Chiang Kai-shek slogan was counterattack the mainland because he still wanted to retake the mainland and he had his government in the Taiwan all ready to reestablish his government on the mainland if he'd been able to do so. And of course he wasn't able to do so. So the goal is there, but as I mentioned in my remarks, that's a longer term goal. And China has said their policy is to strive for peaceful unification. But on the issue of separating Taiwan from China, they say they will use force if necessary to prevent that. They reserve the right to use force on unification, but at the moment they still say their policy is to strive for peaceful unification. Right. That's good. We don't make that distinction. So when China saber rattles, to send a signal to Taiwan that it's trying to break loose from the mainland, we say they're getting ready to invade the island. And that's not what they're doing. Because we don't recognize the distinction between using force to prevent separation as opposed to using force to complete unification. Thank you. Right now we have a question submitted from one of our attendees in chat. Her name is Patricia Dooley. She is very um, knowledgeable about China. Um, it's a long question, so please forgive me. Given the current DPP rule in Taiwan and its economic success, wealth generation and continuing liberalization of the political power of all of its citizens, what is the current and future role, if any, of the KMT Nationalist Party in Taiwan or the ROC? It seems the KMT still supports the expansion of economic ties while maintaining a conservative political stance, refusing to recognize the two China policy. Hong Kong's and Ukraine's current situation is worrisome for all of Taiwan's people and political parties making the US-China status quo unstable. You have raised the central problem of politics in Taiwan. You used to have a balance between the Democratic Progressive Party and the KMT. And when Taiwan first became democratic, power had also been transferred from the mainlanders to the Taiwan people. And this was very disturbing for the mainland because the legitimacy of the government no longer rested on having the claim to be the government of all of China because they had democratic elections. And so we had a shift of government from the KMT to the DPP back to the KMT. But the sentiment in Taiwan against unification has gotten stronger. And the KMT was clobbered in the last two presidential elections. So that the balance in Taiwan between the DPP and the KMT has become unstable. And the KMT is struggling for survival. And we'll have to see how the elections play that out in 2024, because the answer to your question will depend to a great degree on whether or not the KMT is able to recapture a position that can challenge the DPP. The problem for the DPP 
is going to be the security issue that is emerging. Because while our relations with China have been in rapid decline for five years, and we now are openly talking about the possibility of conflict with the mainland, Taiwan has a completely peacetime defense budget. It's around 2% of GDP or below that. They went away from having conscription to now a, uh, a, a young tiny, a, a Taiwan male only has to serve for about three months and never holds a rifle as part of their training. The readiness of their military forces is low. I've been told by admirals and generals in, in Taiwan that the mainland's readiness is much higher than the readiness of the military forces in Taiwan. So the problem is, as we are increasingly focused on the problem of possibly getting into a conflict over Taiwan with the mainland, Taiwan is not carrying its share of the burden. And if the DPP has to do what it says it's going to do, which is raise the defense budget, get the military forces more willing to fight, their popularity is going to be affected. And so the question is, are they going to be able to live up to the promises that we are demanding of them in order to be sure that we are not simply being used by the Taiwanese to fight their battle with the mainland while they continue to have a peacetime defense establishment? So this is a big issue for the political future in Taiwan, and we don't know how that's going to play itself out. Very interesting. Next, we're going to have someone join us on camera. This is Joe Rumanier. Joe. Ah, uh, you're uh, muted, uh, Joe. There we go. Do you hear me now? Yep. Uh, my question has to do with the relationship of the top leaders of China and Russia, and it was uh, a picture during the Olympics of. Putin with Xi Jinping, it was almost a surreal uh, picture. It took us back to 1958, and we know how that ended. So I, what is the personal relationship between these two men? And is it last? I, from what I know about China and Taiwan, I, I cannot imagine anybody in China treating Russia in any way as an equal in any enterprise. Maybe I'm dated myself, but that's just how I feel. And it, how, what is the personal relationship in these two, 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 two people? And does it expand all through the governments of both China and Russia? Uh, it's a very good question. Uh, for several decades now, Chinese relations with Russia have grown increasingly close because both of them did not like having a unipolar world in which the United States as the sole superpower was able to throw its weight around. So both of them adopted the slogan of multipolarity as the way the international community should be structured. And they have welcomed what they see as the decline of the United States and the decline of Europe as contributing to the sort of multipolar world they would like to see. So there is a strong strategic rationale for the close relations between China and Russia. In popularity polls, actually, the Chinese are looking favorably on the Russians now, much more so than in the past, even though the power relationship between them has altered overwhelmingly in China's favor. 30 to 40 years ago, China and Russia had roughly the same size economy. China's economy is now 10 times larger than Russia. Russia, China is its largest trading partner. China, Russia is not even in the top 10 of its trading partners. So you have a really unbalanced relationship. And until 2014, Putin was nervous about using Russian resources to contribute to the growth of China because he was not happy at seeing China's 
economy becoming so much larger than that of Russia. But after the events in the Maidan in Ukraine and the ouster of the pro-Russian government and the institution of a government that wanted to join uh, NATO, uh, Putin felt he had no choice but to abandon his reservations about getting closer to China. So the way I have characterized it is until 2014, the relationship between China and Russia was close and healthy. And the relationship now is close and unhealthy because Russia is having to depend more on China than Russians are comfortable with. But we make a mistake if we think that we can somehow put a wedge between them, even though I think that China has been badly embarrassed by the fact that when Putin and Xi Jinping issued their joint statement last month, talking about this rock solid strategic partnership between the two countries, it's not an alliance. And in fact, the Chinese foreign minister in a press conference a few days ago made it clear that China's policy is no alliances, uh, but it's a strong strategic partnership. And here is Russia invading Ukraine, with which China has very good relations. China buys a lot of grain from Ukraine. They have provided assistance to Ukraine, and they have not endorsed the action that Putin has taken but they have been careful to not use terms like aggression in speaking out and saying they believe that the sovereignty and territorial integrity of all countries should be respected. So China is uncomfortable and wiggling a bit now because the timing of their close demonstration of their strategic partnership was not good in terms of what Putin had in mind in attacking Ukraine. Thank you very much for that. So we have a question now from Megan Hughes, who's watching in the audience. Um, she's asking, given the autocracies of China and Russia and their ambitions, and given the backsliding of democracy in the US, what implications from your point of view does that have for the future? I was in the foreign service a long time. And I have seen democracies rise and fall. I have seen uh, uh, autocratic countries like China engage in a sustained growth rate that has no parallel in history. But I've also seen countries run into trouble when their policies no longer are as well conceived as they were originally in China. I think that we were lucky to be able to celebrate when the collapse of the Soviet Union occurred, that all of the successful countries in the world had democratic systems of governance. And as a result, China's modernization was going to be under the influence of democratic systems because China turned to the modernized countries of the world for the type of assistance and educational training that they were looking for. But that has now changed. The global financial crisis uh, really took the shine off the Western democracies because they both were hit hard by the financial. China had genuinely believed that financial people in the United States were the masters of the universe. And they were disillusioned when the financial crisis hit. So China no longer believes that the United States has a special skill in managing economic and financial issues. And as a result, they're going their own way. But as I noted in my remarks, Xi Jinping is departing from the successful strategy that Deng Xiaoping put in place in China in the 1980s and it was followed by two of his successors. She is the first one to deviate from that. And it's not at all clear 
that he is going to be successful in sustaining the growth rates that China has to sustain in order to get out of the middle income trap. So there are big question marks now as to whether the authoritarian system in China is going to be as successful as Xi Jinping claims it is going to be. Uh, he is sort of glorying in the fact that China is setting a model for other countries to follow. This is a lot of nonsense because Xi Jinping also emphasizes that everything in China has to have Chinese characteristics. Well, if everything has Chinese characteristics, then it's not a model that other countries can readily follow. They don't have a Confucian influenced workforce that puts enormous importance culturally on education and advancement, uh, hard working. Uh, the Confucian societies of East Asia, Japan, Korea, China, Vietnam, all are hardworking and put enormous emphasis on education as the way to get ahead. And uh, uh, China's educational system is being damaged by the current crackdown. So we'll have to wait and see how that works itself out. Now we're going to welcome Pauline Barnes, who is going to ask you a question on camera. I'd like to, um, I'd like to come back to the One China policy. Um, and the question of unification, which you have said is China's ultimate goal. You've also described it as recovery of, of Taiwan. But in the decades since that one China, since we um, acceded to that one China policy, um, Taiwan and China have grown further apart. Taiwan has become democratic. Um, and China has undergone tremendous changes, as you pointed out. It has also become less modern in a sense after Deng Xiaoping and his two successors. But unification in China's eyes essentially means absorption of Taiwan, does it not? It would be the absorption. China have, surely does not have in mind um, coexisting with a democratic state or province. Um, as part of China. It would be absorption or unification on China's terms, not Taiwan's democratic values. Are you, is, is that the way you see it playing out? Is that something you endorse? Do you think that should be US policy to, to acknowledge that that is the inevitable fate of Taiwan? Absolutely not. US policy has said that our interest is in a peaceful resolution of the issue. And that means if both sides of the Taiwan Strait peacefully agree to unification, the United States will not object. But if they peacefully agree that Taiwan separates from China and becomes an independent place, the United States also will not object. The requirement is it be peaceful. At the moment, there is no possibility of peaceful resolution of the problem. That means you have to maintain a status quo for as long as necessary to see if attitudes change. Over the last 30 to 40 years, attitudes in Taiwan have not changed in favor of unification. If anything, they have become more uh, intense against unification. But Taiwan is self-governing. If it were under the thumb of Beijing, as the Uyghurs in Xinjiang are, that would be one thing. But at the moment, Taiwan's a thriving democracy, which is doing better than most independent countries in the world in terms of its economic growth. So there's no urgency to end Taiwan's self-governing status and turn it into an independent country. And those who want to do that are going to precipitate a crisis, which may very well result in the destruction of Taiwan. So therefore, that's why I put my emphasis on, you need to have a stable, sustainable status quo to wait and see whether attitudes change. Now, I'm not talking five, 10 years. I'm talking about 50, 70 years. Taiwan, I mentioned, has a per capita income equivalent to that of Canada, 
Australia. A lot of that success was because of the enormous cross-strait trade that Taiwan had with the mainland. It's a little, think of Cuba. If Cuba had a good relationship with the United States, it would have a per capita income 10 times higher than what it has now because its prosperity is linked to a significant degree to whether it has a good relationship with the big mainland market next to it. Well, Taiwan is in a similar situation. And 50 years from now, Taiwan may be prepared to have a relationship with the mainland that's different from what it's prepared to have now. Now, the other side of the coin is what is mainland China's attitude. Actually, the deal that they offered to Taiwan was quite different from the deal they offered to Hong Kong. Hong Kong, both of them were called one country, two systems. But we have seen in Hong Kong what that means when the system in Hong Kong moves in directions that the mainland can't tolerate. In the case of Taiwan, they said they would not have any officials civilian or military on the island, and Taiwan could maintain its own armed forces. So it was clear that the way they structured the Taiwan deal was it would in a paper sense be part of China, but it would still be running its own affairs as a genuinely self-governing entity. Now that was formulated at a time when China was much weaker than it is now. So what we don't know is whether the Chinese would be prepared to continue to uh, hold that out. But Taiwan wasn't interested at any point in the deal that was offered by the mainland. So from the Taiwan standpoint, it's either maintain the status quo or go for independence. Going for independence is too dangerous and therefore majority polls in Taiwan show they would prefer to have the status quo rather than the dangers of independence. And that's what we need to reestablish is a stable um, status quo. And you can't do that if you try to have official relations with Taiwan, because that's a violation of the one China principle. Is that is that clear? <laughs> yes, I, I'd love a follow up question. And that is, do you think, uh, would you guess under Xi Jinping, do you think that China actually would adhere to that, um, that approach? Not if they could get away with it. Um, uh, we wanted China to, to forswear using force against the uh, against uh, Taiwan. And they said it's a domestic issue. No country says it won't use force to deal with domestic problems if necessary. Uh, so the, the conclusion of our presidents at the time, which I agree with, is selling defensive arms to Taiwan is better than a pledge by China that it won't use force against Taiwan. Uh, so what Taiwan has to do is it has to be strong enough so it can't simply be easily gobbled up. And then the United States is a factor because the Taiwan Relations Act says if there's a threat to Taiwan, we'll treat it as a threat to the security of the Western Pacific and act accordingly. People call this ambiguity. I don't call that ambiguous. We're saying we will follow a constitutional procedure. Uh, the president will consult with Congress and we will do what's necessary to deal with the threat. To me, that's pretty clear. So my view is that even if the mainland becomes impatient about unification, the dangers of trying to forcefully liberate Taiwan with the United States possibly becoming involved is a sufficient deterrent so that China can live with a status quo as long as the one China framework is kept intact. And that's what the administration is not doing. It's been pursuing what the Trump administration did, salami tactics, increasing the officiality of our relations with Taiwan, and that's going to lead to a crisis. Thank you. Here is a question from another person in our audience. Her name is Lisa Kissel, and she, this is an interesting one. 
China has been mentioned as a possible negotiator between Ukraine and Russia. Would China be accepted as a negotiator? And if so, would it work? This is a very interesting question because <laughs> the war is between Ukraine and Russia, not between Russia and NATO. If there's a mediator, the mediator has to be acceptable to the two sides. The question is, what would the United States do if Russia and Ukraine agreed that China could serve as a mediator, do we have a say in that? You see, and technically we don't have a say in that if the Ukrainians are prepared to go along with it. So we haven't really thought that through very carefully. There's no question that China at the moment could not be trusted as an independent negotiator given the closeness of their relationships with Moscow and given the fact that they have leaned over backwards to not use terms such as aggression, invasion, etc., they have clearly implied, and they abstained in, in, in the Security Council vote um, on, on Ukraine as opposed to uh, vetoing it, but uh, they are clearly leaning over backwards to maintain the relationship with Russia as, as they call it, a rock solid basis. Uh, however, the fact that China is showing a willingness to do so is an indicator that China itself feels that it is not an ally of Russia in its aggression against Ukraine. So therefore, if there were a group of moderators, conceivably China could be a part of the group, but certainly it would, China would not fit our definition of what an objective mediator would be. But the question is, what if we disagree with the Ukraine over how you select the mediators? We haven't yet faced up to that problem. Now we're going to be joined on camera by Andrew Wilking. So um, almost exactly 60 years ago, the United States made clear during the Cuban Missile Crisis that it would never allow a foreign power to set up shop militarily so close to our shores. And yet, uh, since before that time, we have set up a military shop in Taiwan, almost as close to mainland China as Cuba is to us. So that's to me a little hypocritical. Um, maybe it's time for a little real politic. Um, would China make any concessions to the United States if the United States said to Taiwan, you're on your own, okay? We're withdrawing not only all of our military presence, which according to Texas Senator uh, Cornyn has been increased recently, but um, we're, we're not gonna support you in any way. And, you know, of course, that would be uh, a gross portrayal, but, you know, these days, portrayals come and go all the time. As I say, would uh, China uh, make any concessions to the United States if we did that? No, but it's a theoretical question. We can't just walk away from Taiwan. First of I'm all, it's domestically impossible for any administration. Uh, if, if there is anything in which there's unanimity in Congress, it's to do everything we can to shore up the security of Taiwan. And there are hundreds of bills literally in, in the Congress, all designed to do something nice for Taiwan. So walking away from Taiwan is not domestically feasible. But we also have very important alliance relationships in East Asia with Japan, with Korea, with the Philippines, with Thailand, with the Australians. And if we walked away from Taiwan, uh, it would send shock waves through Japan in particular, uh, because Japan looks to the United States to preserve Japanese interests in Taiwan 
which the Japanese can no longer defend because they were the offensive party that took Taiwan away from China originally. So they have to count on the United States. And if they think the United States is abandoning Taiwan, then we have a real problem with our most important ally in East Asia. So I don't think the, the hypothesis that you put forward is a realistic one, but I don't think that uh, uh, if we did what I think is impossible, uh, I don't think the Chinese would give us anything. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Appreciate that. Um, this is a, a question from Marilyn Wilking. And I'm glad she's asking it because I was thinking the same thing. Could you explain a little bit more dual circulation and middle class trap that you mentioned in your presentation? I was sort of lost there. Okay. <laughs> Ch um, China growth rate was achieved by investment and uh, by exports. Originally, it depended heavily on investment. And then it became one of the world's largest exporting countries. And China's exports began to add one to 2% to GDP growth every year. And this is when China was growing at a rate of uh, double digits. Uh, in, in the low double, the double digits. But that is a risky way to be behave because they were running up gigantic budget surpluses, uh, trade surpluses with the United States, and we were retaliating against them. And they began to realize that the, to have a growth rate dependent on uh, trade was politically risky. And so therefore, they began to want to put more emphasis on domestic consumption as a driver of growth. And this is what we Americans were telling the Chinese they needed to do because China has an ultra high savings rate. Uh, you know, we might save five to 6% uh, in statistical terms and the Chinese are saving 50%. So there are enormous amounts of funds available inside China because of their high savings rate. Dual circulation means to try to have a, a domestic consumption contribution to growth along with the trade and external factors. So China wants to retain its role in a globalized economy, but have the domestic factor uh, pick up. And that's called dual circulation. Uh, common prosperity is an effort to address the fact that there is a egregiously skewed income distribution in China now, with ultra wealthy people at the top, and and wildly uh, there are more billionaires in China by far than there are in the United States, or or anywhere else in the world and global consumption of consumer uh, luxury products is driven by the Chinese market because uh, you have that type of wealth in China at the top. The middle income trap is the problem that countries have of continuing to sustain uh, uh, growth. Take China, for example. Why was China able to grow so rapidly? The answer is urbanization. China used to be a rural country where the majority of the population were farmers. Now that's been reduced to a much smaller percentage. In that 60% or 60 plus percent of China is urbanized now. Well, what's the implication of that? The productivity of an urban worker is 20 times that of a rural worker. So if you are moving people from rural jobs to newly created jobs because of your expanding manufacturing capability uh, in the cities, you get a gigantic boost in your productivity and that's where you get the rapid growth. But the problem is urbanization slows down. So then how do you make up for that? Well, what happens is most countries 
fail. They get to a middle class level of development and they can't get to the uh, OECD level of development. And the only way they can do that is through increase in productivity and in creativity. And China recognizes that challenge and that's what's called the middle income trap. As I mentioned, 90% of countries who get to middle income levels can't get out of it. Right. They can't get up there with Canada and the United States and Taiwan. Uh, and to do that, China has to uh, find some substitute for urbanization as a way of driving their, um, uh, their growth. So that's what the middle income trap is. It's the, it's the fact that most countries are unsuccessful in continuing to rise to major economic status. Thank you very much for the clarification. Next, we're going to be joined by Lynn Reed, who's going to be on camera. Hello, State. How are you? Hi. Um, we've, we've been analyzing, everybody's been analyzing Putin's motivation for invading Ukraine ad nauseum. <laughs> what, what is really driving Xi Jinping? Does he need to, does he need Taiwan in, in Hong Kong? Is it leftover past humiliations or of a former great power long ago? <laughs> is it hatred of the West, a love of communism, a love of China? Or is it a simple lust for power? Well, I want to know about this man or your, your thoughts. Thank you. China at the beginning of the 19th century had the highest GDP in the world. And then they became victims of European countries. You had the 18 opium war in 1840 you had a gigantic civil war in China um, in the, at the same time as the US Civil War, uh, right. even more bloody in China. Uh, you had the Boxer uprising, uh, uprising at the end of the, uh, of, the, of the 19th century. And so China from a wealthy, well-managed country became a poorly managed country that was the victim of foreign aggression. Mm -hmm. All of China's wars, uh, in the 19th century were fought inside China. Uh, in the 20th century, they were fought in the borders of China, India, Korea, Vietnam, uh, etc. So the dream of China has been to restore wealth and power, mm -hmm. uh, which are the two dreams uh, that the back in the Qing dynasty, the reformers had that goal, wealth and power. And wealth is the it means a vigorous economy. So during that century of humiliation, which is what the Chinese call it, they fought a war with Japan, lost, and Japan took away Taiwan from China. Um, it had been a province of China under the Qing dynasty. If you go back before the Qing to the Ming and before that, uh, Taiwan was basically uh, barely settled. Uh, and so there you can get into all sorts of questions of how long has China act, Taiwan actually been part of China. But what from the Chinese standpoint, they lost Taiwan when they were weak. Mm -hmm. And there was an agreement at Cairo during World War II that when Japan was defeated, Chiang Kai-shek attended the meeting, and the agreement was that the territories that had been lost to Japan uh, would be restored to China. So in 1945, when the Japanese were defeated, uh, it was the Chinese forces who went to Taiwan and uh, uh, accepted the surrender of the Chinese troops. And so the Chinese restored Taiwan as part of China. But after 1945, China got into a civil war between the Chinese nationalists and the Chinese communists. And so there was never able to be a peace treaty with Japan. Mm. So the formal process of Japan signing a peace treaty with China in which Taiwan is formally restored to China never took place. Mm. Mm. But in fact, if possession is nine tenths of the law, uh, Taiwan was restored to China in 1945. And that's the position of the Chinese communists 
Oh. And that's the position of the Chinese nationalists. Hmm. In other words, uh, the U.S. view that the status of Taiwan has not been officially determined was not accepted by either side of the Chinese Civil War. Hmm. But from the, you now no longer have the mainlanders in charge of the government in Taiwan. Right. So from their standpoint, that history, from their standpoint, doesn't matter. But from the standpoint of the mainland, it does matter. And so that's why they want Taiwan restored to China. Mm -hmm. But as I mentioned, the terms they offered to Taiwan uh, were more or less keeping the um, Taiwan within the envelope of China without actually having physical control of the okay. island. Uh, but it's not clear whether or not they would still stick to that type of an approach. And they're not to be trusted, as we can see in Hong Kong, where they have openly violated the terms they negotiated with the British over the reversion of Hong Kong to the mainland. So uh, it would be crazy to trust the Chinese on these matters. But if Taiwan can keep its own armed forces, that would provide some assurance that they couldn't just be uh, pushed around. So what about Xi? What's driving him besides that, personally? Well, uh, I think he's looking for an achievement. Mm -hmm. What he has done is, without setting a specific deadline, he has said that the great rejuvenation of the Chinese people should be completed by mid-century. And it can't be completed if it hasn't completed unification also. Mm -hmm. Well, that's an implicit deadline. Yeah, okay. And it's a hopelessly unrealistic deadline because you have to change attitudes in Taiwan if you're going to have a peaceful resolution. Mm -hmm. And they have been unable to change attitudes in Taiwan. Okay. So my view is that you could hold Chinese impatience over unification at bay as long as you are able to keep Taiwan within a one China framework. Right, right, right. But, but if you try to start pushing Taiwan and promoting independence for Taiwan, mm -hmm. then China has said it will use military force to prevent that. And then you get the conflict. But Xi, the, Xi Jinping, what, what is, what's behind well, he's in him? Charge. He's in charge of this process. Is it, a, is it a lust for power for him? Or love well, of communism, love of China, love of... It's all of the, all of the above. All of the above. All, all of the above. Uh, he's, he's been in power a long time now. Uh, he's changed his approach. He originally yeah. began to strengthen market forces in China. Then he okay. ran into difficulties and now he's counting more on the state owned enterprises. Uh, he has abandoned the dung concept that you keep a low profile and don't grasp for leadership internationally. Uh, he's now grasping for leadership internationally. So I would say, He's showing the standard characteristics of rising countries. He's the Teddy oh. Roosevelt of, uh, of the United States. Interesting. You know, oh, opportunity that's a good... for a war with Cuba, great. Opportunity to grab the Philippines, great. Opportunity to grab Hawaii, great. All of that was done as we were a rising power. <laughs> that's a great answer. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm never going to be able to see him again without seeing a Teddy Roosevelt hat on his head. Um, <laughs> next, we're going to be hearing from um, Ambassador Adrian Bessera. Uh, OK, now I'm unmuted. Am I on? Yes, you're on. OK, thanks, thanks. OK, so it, it's looking pretty bad <laughs> in terms of potential confrontation on Taiwan <coughs> with regard to Taiwan. So I want to come back to the question of alliances. So even though Ukraine is not a member of the EU or of the NATO alliance, Russia's invasion has galvanized members of both organizations into a very strong response in defense of Ukraine. So there, I wanna talk about the analogy in Asia. How likely are America's allies who are like-minded with Taiwan and with regard to democracy, et cetera, uh, how li likely are countries like Japan, uh, all, all of America's allies in Asia to join with the US in defense of Taiwan if China were to invade or blockade Taiwan? And uh, within that, how much of a role 
uh, of the, the, the willingness to defend themselves and the ability to defend themselves as the Ukrainians have demonstrated, how, how, from what you said, that might be a little more difficult uh, to, uh, for the, uh, the, the, the Taiwanese might not be as convincing uh, an ally to defend if they're not as vehement in their own defense or prepared in their own defense. Anyway, that, that, I, that, that whole alliance question is the one that I wanted to, uh, given the analogy to Ukraine. <clears throat> Um, what has the Russian aggression against uh, Ukraine accomplished? Uh, Putin has accomplished what the presidents of Ukraine ever since 1991, when Ukraine became independent, didn't succeed, which is he's unified the country. So the Eastern Ukrainians and the Western Ukrainians who come from different historical backgrounds and the Russian speakers are in the East, etc. They are all part of a Ukrainian nationalism, which has been forged as part of the resistance to Russian aggression against Ukraine. That's where Japan is a problem. And there's a debate in the China watching community over whether it's wise to try to get Japan committed to assisting us if there's Chinese aggression against Taiwan, because that is the one thing that would unite all Chinese against <laughs> Japan. <laughs> I'm not joking. I know, no, I don't, don't realize it's a joke. It just increases the, the depth of our dilemma. <laughs> well, that shows that why we have reservations about the things the Biden administration is doing. Because the Biden administration has, has used diplomatic capital to get the Chinese to speak the Japanese, to speak out in terms of concern about the security of Taiwan. Uh, and many of us think that's the last thing we should be doing. It's one thing to have private conversations with the Japanese about it, but for the Japanese to openly take an interest in the security of Taiwan, when they are the ones who took Taiwan away from China in the first place, is not good diplomacy. I agree. That, that's where the uh, attention to nuance on the part of the Biden administration leaves something to be desired. Uh, also, there's split views in Japan on that. Uh, just as there's split views in Japan on um, on what about the China. what about the other allies, the Australians, the Koreans, etc. How would they line up in a confrontation on Taiwan? Uh, the Koreans would uh, do everything possible not to get involved. Uh, the Australians would be involved. Uh, they're good allies in that sense. But uh, one of the reasons why I myself I'm skeptical of the AUKUS deal under which we agreed to sell nuclear submarines to um, Australia is what kind of a defense posture are we putting up in East Asia when it's the former colonial powers who are getting together to hold China at bay? There's not a single Asian as part of AUKUS except Australia, if you want to call it an Asian. But they're white skinned, just like, you know, you and me. Uh, to, to me, the, the, the visibility of that agreement was atrocious. And it's not accidental that Indonesia and Malaysia, two critically important countries in Southeast Asia, instantly criticized the agreement. If we want to put together a group of like minded countries, to strengthen our ability to handle the expansion of Chinese influence in East Asia, we need the Asians as part of that. And that's what, not just Japan, not just Korea. We need the Southeast Asians in particular to be part of that group. And we are not successful so far in getting that type of support. So that's an area where we need to be paying particular attention. Dave, I think uh, we're going to have to get you back in the fall and see you after. <laughs> we we're facing a very, very difficult future. Uh, and this, all the things we're talking about could, could, be cha could change drastically in the next few months. But I, I think we've kept you longer than we had bargained for. And uh, I, I, will, I will thank you and leave it to Tara to close our session. Hey, just let me make one final point. Sure. One thing that China has noted <clears throat> has been how successful the United States has been in mobilizing the Europeans to oppose the Russian aggression in Ukraine, including financial sanctions on Russia 
that are far beyond what most people thought would be possible. That has to give China pause in thinking about using force against Taiwan. And to do that, we'd need the Japanese, among others, if we were to put uh, heavy or threaten heavy economic sanctions as a countermeasure uh, if, if uh, the, the Chinese... Well, the Japanese up. are part of the Ukraine sanctions, and they, they would be part of sanctions if, if China were to use military force against Taiwan. So there's much unfinished business, uh, and uh, we thank you enormously for your extremely broad... How I, uh, you've covered an extraordinary number of subjects this evening and uh, given us a tremendous amount of food for thought. So I, I thank you on behalf of our whole group of uh, not just Walpole, but all over the world. Now that we're going, uh, doing these through Zoom, uh, we, we're greatly enlightened and, and grateful to you. Tara, do you have any closing words before we close the session? And let I just want to echo your thanks to <laughs> Stapleton Roy. It was a fascinating and informative and um, mind-boggling evening. I thank you very much for sharing your knowledge with us. And okay. I just want to tell everybody to make sure to tune in. We're going to have other speakers for the remainder of the year. Watch for notices. Thank you all for joining us. And um, have a good night. Thank you. Thanks thank again. Bye-bye.